Yes, yes. Welcome to the ancient world of tabletop games. I am Agamemnon from the historical documentary Time Bandits. This is a report from a fugitive. Ah! Hello, and welcome to another episode of Dad vs. Daughter. I'm Tim the Dad. And I'm Megan the Daughter. Wait, something's not right here. This meeple's meant to be blue. Rawr. For video production of board games, I pondered the use of plastic balls or tubs on the table. Why? Components. No eye of newt or toe or frog here were not considering material components for spells from dungeons and dragons. Game bits and pieces must gather somewhere when not in use. When not in play, game pieces reside in the box, if possible. For ease of organization, set up and putting away, it's best to give those many, many, many wooden cubes and plastic ponds their own storage facilities. Boxes on boxes on boxes, containing worlds of cardboard counters and wooden cubes. But what of play, though? In the olden times, we just poured tokens onto the table. Occasionally, we'd use tubs or cups. Once we paid a player a mountain of chocolate buttons. Uh, that player went down on all fours, acting as a mobile display unit. And that is a board gaming fact. The problem with tubs and itsy-bitsy, teeny-weeny, timey-wimey counters is this. The clumsy player camps out next to the tubs, ready to pounce. There's always a clumsy player in the group. If the clumsy player can't make it that night, another less clumsy player gains enough experience points to level up and adopt a new character class, going from third-level fighter to twentieth-level fingerless bastard in one swift tumble. You wouldn't trust the clumsy player as far as the clumsy player could roll dice. The clumsy player can roll dice so hard and fast under the table that you'll be digging dinosaur fossils out of the resultant escape tunnel for the rest of your days. A clumsy player will walk into a room, wander around the table, inspect all the chairs twice, and then sit on the one chair that has fragile game components stacked on it. Those fragile game components were stacked on the chair by the less clumsy player, of course. This is the Olympic Games of clumsiness, and the clumsy player will somehow scatter every type of game component to the four corners of the earth using the power of the four winds, sending the pieces skittering under the hooves of horses belonging to the four cardboard standees of the apocalypse. A greased-up Butterfinger simply knows no limits. Beware the swirling vortex of the thumbless one's attempt to set right all that went wrong in the previous move. No Euro game is safe, and even the tackiest of Ameritash games must succumb, in the end, to the raw power of physical ineptitude displayed by a good-natured yet dexterously lacking game companion. Solution? Attempt to alleviate the situation by playing games that don't call for the throwing of dice, the pushing of cubes, financial micromanagement based around breeze-blown paper notes, or anything remotely involving flicking game pieces at other game pieces. Wear a helmet and carry a shield if you must play Yahtzee. Ah, but that reminds me of the Yahtzee incident. There are some things mankind was not meant to know, and luckily for us, the stars are not yet right. Boxes and counters and tubs, oh my! Storage like this, for the massive game Fortune and Glory, is portable. I like to think if storage has a handle on top, then even the clumsiest player could transport game pieces without losing any teeth. Trekking to a gaming club or making house calls to deliver gameplay the way old-timey doctors delivered babies, you'll find chunky storage is the best option. Especially for a game like this, with extra layers of components in one box and an extra box lurking in the depths with even more layers of components inside that deeper receptacle, including bits and pieces you bought in to add to the game's flavour. But what of play, though? We must ask again, what of it? 
One idea, sparked from time spent in the trenches of game clubs, is the side table. Walk into a gaming club, set up a table for a small group or two tables for an army of dungeoneers, throw down a cloth, gather chairs for the players. If there are enough tables available, set up a side table, deposit all the figures, floor plans and rule books on that handy supporting surface. Yes, that's a role-playing game example, but it serves for our purposes. I have a small side table here in the studio. It isn't really meant to serve as a staging post for game bits during play. The idea is to have a second camera on the side table to show other game-related things if the board on the main table consumes too much space. Yes, I'm looking at you, Arkham Horror, no matter the Cyclopean edition you inhabit. Any unused flat surface will throw itself at the chance to store game bits, and so I considered the possibilities. Would I keep the compartmented box open and unseen on the side table for access to bits and pieces? Perhaps I'd do that anyway, but transfer a few of the handier material components to the main table and keep those vital ingredients in plastic bowls. I was a short, cliched hop, skip, and a clumsy jump from committing to whatever plastic bowls I could lay hands to. They had to be a decent size and not too shiny for video purposes. Obviously, I wondered if anyone put out a storage solution that matched gaming needs to video requirements. When I had a look, I found nothing suitable. I reluctantly considered the shiny plastic bowls and, reeling in horror from the prospect, looked again for alternatives. Right in front of me, Dogmite Games opened a Kickstarter for the component collector. Those bastards. How dare they solve a problem I'd only just stumbled across by providing a solution I'd only just stumbled across. Bastards. Why do I say this? Throughout their Kickstarter campaign, the DMG Wood Wizards kept adding new tile designs to the long list of options. I miscalculated and misremembered and unmeasured my catch-all gaming requirements, filtered through the video lens. If I order four of these sets, expanded to twelve tiles a box in different shades, I'd have everything covered. Surely. Out comes another option for a tile. The swine. How dare they offer more choice? Ridiculous. That rumbling sound of one more option heralds the end of everything? Let's hear a second opinion. Ah, oh, gee, I, I tell you, Krypton is simply shifting its orbit. And finally, monsieur, a wafer thin mint. Now I'm forced to move a planet out of my way to rearrange the composition of tiles just to accommodate the addition of a tile featuring a planet design on it. Should have gone with supermarket bowls, but supermarkets aren't carving dragons into their bowls. Not that I know of. I need none of this stuff. The best way to film a game is by throwing all the bits and pieces in a heap and grabbing the much-needed item from the top of the middle of the pile, using a trained elephant attuned to the orbital mind control lasers. Alternatively, I can store the cardboard counters at my bank, where they'll be protected from the elements. I hear walls are a thing now, and they help keep the damp out, and bank robberizers. Every shift in the tiles on offer made me wonder. Who is building houses out of these chunks of wood? Round up the usual suspects. I'll name no names here. The standard component collector on offer was made up of a dice tray as the base, holding eight wooden tiles, all magnetized so that they could fly in tight formation on the gaming table. This product was rounded off by inclusion of a book strap to bind the package. That wasn't enough for my video production purposes. I increased the order to extra-large size, 12 tiles per set, and I ordered the four-pack in different shades and individual designs. We know from the lengthy Kickstarter chatter that people were buying 20 sets of these things, perhaps charitably as an easier way to handle gaming group purchases, or, more cynically, with a view to reselling, apart from those people who were building houses out of the tiles naturally. I've stated before that I've bought gaming equipment purely for this channel. Items I normally wouldn't bother with. Elaborate dice towers, jumbo-sized dice, and so on. Would I buy these tiles if I didn't run a gaming channel? No. I saw the component collector and thought of it as a luxury item. 
I also saw it as a handy toolkit for use on a cluttered table. It's bad enough handling lights camera action with a simple card game, let alone a monster of a board game like Fortune and Glory or Arkham Horror. The component collector came along just as I asked myself the question about how I deal with loads of fiddly game components while making gaming videos. And it had magnets, which I hadn't even considered. Flat tiles, virtually impossible for the clumsy player to tip over. Multiple designs on offer, catering to a massive range of game components, and held together in any sort of configuration by those magnets. I backed the Kickstarter solely for my channel, and here are the tiles on the table. At the same time, Dogmite Games cut a deal with Breaking Games to produce a themed dice tray for Rise of Tribes, I backed that offer, having backed the game, and picked up a second tray as a giveaway on this channel. There was a slight glitch in getting the trays to me. Could have turned awkward, but I pointed that out, and they caught the worst of it in time. Dogmite Games offered to make it up to me somehow. I said to just throw in a piece of wood, carve a meeple for me, but they surprised me by throwing in a whole tile of a meeple, which is why you see this tile on the video. Yes, the company makes mistakes, but it's a company that doesn't want to see disappointment cloud the horizon, an unenviable task keeping that ship to rights. So, what of the tiles? I could bore us all to death with talk of the nature of wooden products, but I'll leave the botany lesson to others. These tiles are made of flame birch, or curly birch, and the DMG website tells us that this wood produces medullary rays. They turned Dr. Banner green during an intense game of Carcassonne, or perhaps that was the fish he ate beforehand. The result of all these medullary rays is a unique patterning of each tile, and the stain brings the effect into focus. A computer-controlled woodcutting machine will give you the same shape each time, but there's no carbon copy effect at work here. Botany, wood green, gives you a unique product each time. My sets aren't going to match your sets, even if you chose the same wood, the same stain, and the same designs. That was part of the appeal of the project down there in the green. There was something missing from these tiles. When I opened assorted dice towers, I had a powerful whiff of tree from a wooden product. Who knew? Quite an experience. You get none of that here. There's a hint of varnish, but that's about the only scent I noticed. Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing glue. The set comes with its own dice tray. I didn't see the need for a double decker, one tray top and bottom. Bad enough that I went for an extra large set, but those double deckers are used in house construction and I had no need of an extra building. Of the book strap, I'll say this. It's a neat enough idea. Easy to unlatch, it's devilishly hard to close. Don't let the clumsy player near this. Though the magnet system employed here is strong, it's not going to cause problems for cameras. Any magnet strong enough to affect a camera mechanically most likely hauled in a nearby car when it was brought into play. Don't concern yourself if you're making videos of component collectors. The system is easy enough. Align the tiles with the dot uppermost and the tiles stick together. Dogmite Games had a million pixies to check the magnets each night from dusk until dawn. No pixies were harmed in the making of these tiles, though a few paper clips were bent out of shape. That's paper clips for you. You won't need to put large blocks of tiles together, though even the largest sections move comfortably across this felt cloth. The magnet system makes it very easy to cater to individual players, giving them small game stations of tiles to operate from. What of the components? Can I fit this counter here or that card there? I don't routinely sleeve game cards. However, I took the deal on sleeves for 878 Vikings and a sleeved card from that game fits the card slots in these tiles. A card is 56 millimeters wide, nearer 59 millimeters when sleeved, and there's wiggle room to spare when slotted into a tile. The card deck tiles will accept a random volcano token with ease. These decks were available in forward and reverse gear to handle a short stack of cards and a discard pile. I used the cards nearest to hand to illustrate this from the 1066 game, which is a huge card deck you'd never stack here, but I thought it best to show larger cards in relation to these tiles. So, do I recommend the component collector as a product? 
This is the point at which I am forced to timestamp my response. As I record this video in November 2018, the component collector is not available to buy directly from the Dogmite Games website. It's in pre-order only for 2019, as the company is still fulfilling the Kickstarter. That Kickstarter forced the company to change just to fulfill the Kickstarter. When the project was funded, the company moved into a larger factory a month later and began the business of hiring on enough staff to double the workforce. By the company's own admission, it looked likely that the component collectors would reach customers at the end of time itself. Did I care about the delay? Right now I'm staring at another Kickstarter that funded a month later with planned delivery going back half a year now and the inevitable slow boat from China will place that game in my hands in early 2019. The problem with Kickstarter is that it's Kickstarter. A little perspective. I spent three years setting this channel up. Partly that was to gradually construct a studio and switch to a new computer so I could handle video processing more speedily. Mostly I spent the time amassing a library of board games for video purposes. At an average of one board game purchase every two weeks, I felt it would take at least two years to have a workable collection. The only cause of inching closer to a hundred games now lies in buying a five-in-one compendium so I could talk about backgammon. Board gaming video channels don't need a warehouse of games to get by on. When I looked at those channels with a wall of 300 games to choose from, I decided I'd make do in a fraction of that. Setting the channel up, I looked to Kickstarter as an experiment. I'm happy to report it's an experiment that's pretty much done. If I saw something that solved a problem for me in terms of equipment, I did my research and backed what I felt I needed for the channel. This video contains several Kickstarter items. Rise of Tribes, 1066 Tears to Many Mothers, the Component Collector, and the specialized camera mount that I now use in addition to my regular overhead camera rig. That's a Zen mount, and it attempted to be all things to all users. Luckily for me, I didn't go after the laptop holder. I only wanted an adapter for cameras, so my expectations were met. I don't think any of those Kickstarters reached me less than six months late. That didn't matter to me, spending a lot of time setting the channel up. But now that I am making videos, Kickstarter won't solve problems right in front of me right away. If I need a piece of equipment for a video next week, I want to buy it now and have it in place next week. The same goes for a game. If I decide to do a video about a particular game mechanism and I don't have an example on my shelves, then I'll buy one in and make the video seven days later at most. I expected the component collector to be in my hands in 2019, the year I'd finally start making videos. Well, I brought production forward, and here I am, timestamping my verdict in a video that's turned into a brief meditation on the usefulness of Kickstarter. All of which is neither here nor there if you are watching this video in the far-flung future. So, with the future in mind, do I recommend the component collector? For what I paid, I'll certainly wring my use out of these tiles. Will you? I still view the component collector as a luxury item. My dice towers are for stopping dice from rolling off the table. No holding up production, otherwise I wouldn't buy dice towers. If I didn't have a video channel, I'd use bowls or bags or the table itself to hold game components. I wouldn't have bought these component collectors. Video requirements gave me another view, though. You'll have to decide on the usefulness of useful things based partly on price. The Kickstarter price was discounted with a long lead-in time to production. I was around halfway through the backer list and it took a year for these to arrive. Those of you perusing the Dogmite Games website in the far-flung future will have less time to wait, though that will cost you more in handy currency tokens. Uh, which reminds me, uh, the metal coins you see in this video are from Clans of Caledonia, another Kickstarter, and one of the few that shipped very close to the estimated date. That state of affairs is highly unusual, and for once, uh, that really is a board gaming fact.